In the world of passenger air travel, nearly every major milestone was set by the German airship operation DALAG. Its zeppelins flew sightseeing trips across Germany in the years before the Great War, and its advanced potency airliner proved the airship could fly a fixed schedule through wind or rain. However, the airship was lost for Germany along with the war, concluding with the Versailles Treaty. The Zeppelin airship factory was no longer permitted to construct airships for use in Germany, nor was the private airline DALAG permitted to operate them. However, after a British-built airship for the US Navy exploded, a new hope emerged for the Zeppelin enterprise. Dr. Hugo Eckner, the chief of the Zeppelin Corporation and DALAG, offered to build an airship to replace the one which burned. The US Navy took the offer, and airship production was once again allowed in Germany for its construction. The airship was to be a long-range maritime reconnaissance aircraft for the Navy, but Eckner was planning ahead. This new airship would be the pinnacle of Zeppelin design and pave the way for an airliner to span the Atlantic. ZR3 would be just what the company needed, a fresh infusion of much-needed capital and a chance to push the envelope. ZR3 would be a tremendous success, ably traveling across the Atlantic to its new hangar in Lakehurst, New Jersey. The Navy was much impressed with its new ship, Rechristen, the USS Los Angeles, keeping it in service for over 10 years. With Zeppelin back on its feet, Eckner wanted an airship to build on the promise that R3 showed in its cross-Atlantic outing. However, a roadblock appeared between Eckner and his new airliner as he hadn't the money. The startup capital to build and operate a new airship amounted to some 7 million marks, and to try and reach this figure, he would try a massive appeal to the public. The press campaign began in July of 1925, and through public donations and the sale of memorabilia, he was able to amass 2.5 million marks suitable for only the ship's construction and nothing more. In short, the average German was far less secure in their finances, while the affluent noble class, once patrons of the old count, was gone. Regardless, Eckner pressed on, and between 1925 and 26, he gave nearly a hundred lectures on a press circuit which bolstered fundraising efforts. His personal appeal to President Paul Hindenburg brought a state contribution of two million more marks. The loss of the money was found in selling assets from Zeppelin's subsidiary companies. With the funds in hand, the design work was finalized. However, the new LZ-127 would not be the largest nor most efficient airship the company was capable of building. Rather, it was a proof of concept that would show that commercial oceanic air travel was possible. While they had the funds for a new airship, they were still restricted by the size of their hangar at Friedrichshafen which would prevent them from building airships much larger than the wartime X-Class for years to come. By early 1927, LZ-127's design work had been completed, and while built along the same line as ZR-3, it was fully furnished for passenger comfort. The combined gondola would contain control and navigation facilities, along with the passengers' rooms and amenities. The fourth section contained control room, a radio room, and a navigation room, and behind it was the kitchen, dining room and lounge, and passenger quarters. At the rear of the gondola were the stairs, which led to the main crew quarters within the hull, which contained mostly the same amenities, though with none of the fineries which existed below. The style of the passenger quarters evoked that of the famous and luxurious American Pullman railcars, though with some clever features. The passenger berths served dual purposes. By day, there were lounges where passengers could take meals and relax in private, and by night, they could be converted to a two-bunk cabin. While LZ-127 could mostly be described as an enlarged version of the company's previous airship, it did feature a number of innovations. Chief among these were its new Maybach VL2 engines, which in addition to producing a respectable 530 PS, were multi-fuel engine that could run on either gasoline or blaugas. The former was a fuel specially designed for airship use, as it possessed a density very close to air and could be stored in its own gas cells below the hydrogen. 
This enabled them to cut weight and conserve palace hydrogen over long trips, as unlike gasoline, when the Blaukas was burned, it did not significantly alter the weight of the airship and did not require the venting of hydrogen to retain equilibrium. Gasoline usage was kept to a minimum and would typically be reserved for takeoffs. Despite much of the design being brought over from a previous project, the airship was far better equipped for long flights. Its 37 tons of Blaukas could provide fuel for around 100 hours of flight with a similar weight of gasoline providing only 67 hours. The airship was completed in early July 1928, being brought into service on the 8th and named Graf Zeppelin in honor of the late Count. Shortly after a series of shorter test flights, Eckner arranged for a 36-hour endurance flight across Germany on September the 18th. The original course took the ship over Leipzig, Dresden, and Berlin before proceeding to Hamburg to practice oceanic navigation at night over the North Sea. However, the low cloud cover would have prevented the public from seeing the airship along that route, and so they diverted to Frankfurt and Mainz before heading on to Cologne and Dusseldorf before reaching the North Sea via the Rhine Valley. As was the case so many years ago, they were met by massive crowds as they passed these cities before finally heading out to sea. On the next day, their course home took them over Hamburg, Kiel, and Berlin before they proceeded south back to Friedrichshafen. However, not all were pleased. During further flights in October, French authorities protested the flight over the politically contentious Rhine territories and subsequently provided directions for the use of airships over their own territory forcing LZ-127 to fly at night and away from any military installations. The airship's flight over southern England would also prove rather unsettling to those living there as it brought up unpleasant memories. With its test flight over, the next stop was across the Atlantic. Forty crewmen and twenty passengers were assembled for the flight, though few paid for their tickets as they were mostly there to drum up publicity for future flights. This included journalist Liddy Drummond Hay, who had come on behalf of the media mogul William Randolph Hearst, who had exclusive reporting rights in the US for the voyage. One of the four who did pay the small fortune of $3,000 for a ticket was one Frederick Gilvillen. An American financier who had a plane crash and two shipwrecks under his belt. To add to the foreboding, the weather reports were bleak. Storms and strong winds pervaded most of the approach to New York, and numerous older steamships were in distress, while more modern liners were reporting considerable delays to their arrival. Eckener took the airship out on October 11, 1928, opting for a longer but hopefully calmer southern approach. The other captain, Fleming and Schiller, agreed to take a course south to the Mediterranean via the Alps, then to Gibraltar, followed by the Azores, and finally proceeding across the Atlantic to the airfield at Lakehurst. This earlier section of the voyage proved the most enjoyable as passengers and crew overflew the scenic northern Mediterranean with largely agreeable weather. This, however, was not to last. After they flew west of the Azores, they ran into a storm front and in the midst of exchanging the deck crew for the most experienced members, the nose dipped. Pots and pans clattered to the floor, the breakfast table settings slid from the cloth and thunder rang out. While the crew remained in control through the rough weather, the passengers were no less terrified. However, more shockingly, the crew would discover a wide swath of fabric had been torn from the lower port elevator and stabilizing fin and threatened to jam the controls. By the time this was recognized, the Graf Zeppelin was in the middle of the Atlantic and three days from U.S. Navy assistance. After Eckner reported the incident to the Navy, he dispatched a repair team, which included his own son and informed the passenger of the situation. The repair team luckily found the damage to be less threatening than they had worried, and they were able to reattach the third of the fabric that had remained, while cutting away the fluttering edges. The repairmen wore safety tethers while they clung to the outside of the airship and endured the roughly 80 km an hour slipstream as the ship bobbed up and down, with the control crew compensating for the increase in weight brought on by the rain. 
the repair crew worked for around 5 hours until the ship could rely on the fin once more. While the ship was no longer in danger, the new problem became boredom and discomfort. Safety precautions prevented the kitchen from using its electric stoves. Lukewarm coffee was served in glasses as all the china cups had broken in the morning. And perhaps most distressingly, the beer and wine had run out. The passengers, with the exception of Lady Drummond Hay, who brought plenty of warm clothes, learned just how chilly the Atlantic could get, as the airship had little insulation. In the end, the passengers' discomfort was eclipsed by the elation of the crowds that gathered to see the ship as it flew over Washington DC, Baltimore, and Philadelphia before it went on to New York. This would prove prudent as it showed the public that, despite the damage it had taken, it was in no danger and capable of traveling wherever its crew saw fit. The discomfort of many of the passengers was quickly overshadowed by the Graf Zeppelin's arrival at Lakehurst. Some 150,000 people had traveled to Lakehurst, where they were policed by only some 76 marines, 50 sailors, and 40 state troopers. While Eckner received congratulations from President Hindenburg via telegram, he embarked on a number of press ventures and all manner of celebratory events in New York. All the while, he was kept informed of the repairs being made to the airship, which would take 12 days and delay the return to Friedrichshafen until October 28. In all, the trip was successful but with mixed results. On a financial basis, the trip was successful in that it was profitable. The operating costs were judged at $54,000 one way, with cargo and passenger revenues bringing in roughly $70,000. Beyond that were the press deals, which saw Zeppelin receive some $83,000. Eckner would claim a profit of $100,000 which considering the 1 million plus price of the airship meant long-term profitability was feasible. The performance of the airship in the press was seen as both groundbreaking and yet unimpressive. From Germany to the US, the cross-Atlantic voyage took some 111 hours, which actually compared poorly to the world's fastest ocean liner, RMS Mauritania, which managed the crossing in 107. However, this would be dispelled when Graf Zeppelin made the return trip in better weather without detours and arrived 72 hours later. Passenger comforts too were an issue compared with the ocean liner, so with a larger liquor cabinet and a gramophone with an ample selection of records, things were markedly improved on subsequent voyages. Chief of all were safety concerns, as despite the airship being capable of handling the storm and subsequent damage better than any plane, it was still extremely concerning to any serious customer base. There was, however, one feat which could allay these concerns for good, a world tour. However, with the winter fast approaching, such a trip would be put off until a more favorable season. That concludes our look at the beginning of the Graf Zeppelin's long and storied career. Feel free to share your thoughts on these unique vehicles in the comment section. What do you think was lacking from the menu? As always, we here at Plain Encyclopedia appreciate your love and support, so feel free to leave a like and subscribe to know exactly when new content rolls out. If you'd like to buy us some fuel to keep us going, visit us on Patreon or via PayPal. Until next time, stay tuned and keep following our updates.